Now let's celebrate Jesus. God's love is overwhelming. It's reckless in human eyes because it will not stop. It will not relent. It is ruthless and irresistible. And we ignore it at our own peril. 
We are given absolutely every opportunity necessary to come home. And so while God chases us down, the last step is ours. Will we have to turn our heart, our mind, our will, and say yes. You are my Lord. You are God. And I need you. And so whether you are had a great week or you're like me and you got a cold or whatever, if it has been wonderful, celebrate it. If it has not been, endure it. Both come to pass. But wherever you stand now with God, I hope it's close. And if it's not, change it. Come home. Don't delay. We're not promised any more than this moment. Come home now. Good morning. morning. On this, well, it's rather drab out there today, but it is a glorious day in Jesus Christ when we can gather and praise his name and come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, So I welcome you all here. Uh, There are.
If you want to turn with me to John chapter 3, when I get myself all sorted out, we're going to read from there. It's always funny with technology that when you want it to move quickly, it likes to slow down, right? But we're looking at John chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. And we're going to start to look at it today. It's uh, got a lot of information here, and uh, so we're just going to touch base on the basics first here, and then we'll look deeper into it later. So there was a man named Nicodemus a Jewish religious leader uh, who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. How are these things possible, Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned. But the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we ask that you might open the scripture to our minds, to our hearts, to our souls, O Lord. There is such a great truth that is taught here for us, O Lord, that we each and every one of us need to get, that we might be the type of Christian that you would have us to be. So Father, I pray today that the words that I share are your words, and I pray that each and every one of us will take those words to heart. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. See, this is one of the most exciting stories uh, of the Bible. It all has to do with the times in life that happen in all of our lives, not just in Nicodemus. It happens in all of our lives. And we're going to look at this man, Nicodemus, who stood at the brink of something very significant in his life, I think we all know what, what that's like, those, those times in your life when you come right up uh, uh, to the brink of some kind of decision, some kind of commitment, something that, that can change your life, that if you take a step over, it's going to change everything. And if you take a step back, you'll wonder if you'll ever get back to that place in your life again. You're right on that brink. Those on the brink experience, uh, experiences often happen during difficult times in our lives. Times of evaluation. We look at our lives and 
we say to ourselves, I'm looking at my relationship and I'm, I feel like I'm being cheated in all of my relationships. You're on the brink of some kind of commitment, some kind of decision that you need to make. Or you look at your life and can say, I've reached my goal, but it's not satisfying. You're on the brink of something very significant in life. I've noticed when we come to those times, and maybe you've noticed the same thing, one of two things seems to happen in our lives. When you come to those crucial crossroads of life, some people sour while other people soar. Some people see the opportunity, they see the faith, see what faith can do in their lives, they see the the change that Jesus can make and can work in their life, but then they say no and they walk away from him. Bitterness sets in. And that may stay there the rest of your life. And then there's others who see the opportunity of faith and take that step. And instead of of falling, they start soaring. There's a, a kind of growth and a kind of significance that comes into their life that you just can't explain. Well, John 3, we're going to look at this man, Nicodemus, who, who stood on the brink of a most significant decision in his life. A man by this name, Nicodemus, Jesus Christ led him through making a decision that could change his life. So he stood on that brink. He apparently had looked at his life and was asking himself uh, about the success that had happened in his life and whether that success was really meaningful. Do you know what it's like to stand in that kind of brink? You seem like you've achieved a lot in life. A lot has been done. A lot of success has happened in your life. But is it really meaningful success? See, he has is, is reached a goal in, the, in his life, a, a real pinnacle where we're going to find out, but he was questioning whether there was something more, something greater that God had for his life. And we have to ask that. That's one of, one of the on-the-brink experiences for all of us. What makes our lives Successful. And maybe even more important than that, what makes a day successful in our lives? What's the measuring stick of genuine success in our lives? Is it money? Is it education? Is it achievement? Sometimes we get so caught up in the divine, in the drive for success, sometimes we really want, uh, want to happen in our lives. We, we get this chance to take a real hard look and say, I'm heading in the right direction. Am I heading in the right direction? That's what a preacher by the name of George Whitefield was concerned about in the life of a very successful man. He wrote to Benjamin Franklin. He said these words, I find that you grow more and more famous in the learned world. And as you've made such progress in investigating the mysteries of electricity, I now humbly urge you to give diligent heed to the mystery of the new birth. So he's saying to Ben Franklin here, If you think lightning was a mystery, that when you found it out, you found some power, some significance, here's even a greater mystery. Investigate this one. This is a smart preacher. If you've ever read a little bit about Whitefield, you'll know that that's true. 
He knew how to talk to somebody in a way that they could understand. Benjamin Franklin, an inventor, someone who likes to discover things, he says, here's something to discover, Ben. Investigate this mystery of the new birth. It is a most important and interesting study, and when mastered, will richly repay you for all all of the pain. Just like George Whitefield invited Benjamin Franklin to make an investigation of that mystery, I invite you to do the same thing today. Let's take a look at Nicodemus. As we take a look at him and what Jesus had to teach him about this mystery of a new birth, I want us to think together about what this conversation is truly teaches each one of us. What it teaches us about title, how to make a spiritual success out of our life. Because if it's not a spiritual success, if your life is not a spiritual success, no matter how great the achievement is in this world, somehow you've missed The mark. I think we all know that. This conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus teaches us about uh, about how you do that. How you get spiritual significance. How you make spiritual success of everyday life. And the first thing we learn is from the very fact that Nicodemus showed up to talk to Jesus. So verse 3, 1 said... There was a man of of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. That tells us who he is, who he was. If you want to be a spiritual success in life, the first thing we have to do is check your definition, definition of spiritual success. What defines success in your life? If you check it carefully, you might find out that you didn't write that definition. Maybe your parents wrote it for you. Or maybe your boss at work right now is writing that definition for you. Or maybe society has written it for you. Or, Or maybe it was a movie that wrote it for you. All kinds of different things write our definition of success. And we have to be careful to check it. Nicodemus did. Look at what we learn about this guy. There was a man named Nicodemus. First, let's just stop there. Because I, want, I think it's important that he's named here in Scripture. Have you noticed that the Bible tends to name names? It doesn't just say there was a man. We don't tell you who it was because it might embarrass him. It's not what happens here. He came to Jesus. We don't want to tell you uh, when it was because you might figure out who he is. No, that's not what the Bible does, does it? The Bible is an extremely personal book. It's personal to me, and it's personal to you, and it's personal to this guy named Nicodemus. And it tells us things about him very quickly. And they all point to success. First, we learn that he was a Pharisee. Now, today, when we study the New Testament, we hear about Pharisees. We tend to think of bottom of the ladder kind of guys. Uh, They're evil people, and they didn't like Jesus and all of that. But before we get too hard on the Pharisees, There's probably none of us in this room that could live up to the standards these Pharisees lived up to. There was never any more than about 6,000 of them at a time in Israel. That means that Nicodemus was part of a select group of people. Each of them had taken a solemn vow before the Lord and their witness to devote their entire life, every moment, every day to keeping the Ten Commandments. That was the goal. That was success in their life. 
And they did a pretty good job of it. They were very serious about it. They said, we want to make sure that we keep these Ten Commandments. How do we make sure that we keep the Ten Commandments? Uh, So they formed a group called the Scribes. And the scribe's job was to write down rules and laws and regulations that would make sure that the Ten Commandments were kept. They had this big rule in the Ten Commandments, but how do you apply that rule to the different circumstances in life? They would try to write a rule uh, for each of the different circumstances that would show how to make sure that you were keeping the Ten Commandments. And there were lots of rules. Their number one rule book was called the Mishnah. Uh, Just one uh, of the Ten Commandments about keeping, the one about keeping the Sabbath, there are 24 chapters about how to keep the Sabbath. Chapter after chapter, application after application, even that wasn't enough. They had to interpret the Mishnah. So they wrote something called the Talmud, which interpreted the Mishnah had to say about keeping the laws. And in the Talmud, there are 128 pages on just the keeping of the Sabbath. One law. It covered every different circumstance of life. They had to figure it all out. They weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath, but how did you know if you were working or not? For instance, little things like tying a knot. How would you know if you were working or not if you were tying a knot? They decided that if if it was absolutely necessary for human life, then you could tie a knot. But if it wasn't, then you couldn't tie a knot. So for instance, if you wanted to get some water, you had to do that before the Sabbath. You couldn't tie a knot onto a bucket and lower it into the water because that wasn't absolutely necessary. You could go and last another day without the water. That's what the law said. But the law literally said that if a woman wanted to tie a knot in her girdle, uh, that was absolutely necessary for human life. So you could do that on the Sabbath. You ladies can tie a knot in your girdle. The hilarious thing, though, even more hilarious about this, is they found, of course, ways around the law. The law said a knot could not be tied in a rope, but it could, of course, as I said, be tied in a girdle. So if you wanted to get some water out of the well, how could I do it? You know where this is going. (laughs) Creative men were smart. They would get one of their wife's girdles, tie a knot in the girdle and then to the bucket and lower it into the well. Now they kept the law, right? But they missed the whole point. They missed the spirit of it. And that's how silly this got sometimes. And that's how serious they were, though, about keeping the law. So Nicodemus came to, and talked to Jesus. And he was a member of the Sanhedrin, too. Not only a Pharisee, but he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a member of this select group of 6,000 Pharisees, but he also was a member of a select group of 70 religious men who ran the religious affairs of Israel. They ran the affairs of the nation and had religious authority over every Jewish man in the world. He was a very important man. This Nicodemus. Not only was that true, but even more. If we read read in verse 10, the Bible says Jesus called him the teacher. And the word the there is emphasized. The teacher of Israel. So this cut it down from 6,000 to 70, and now it's down to one. Jesus says you're it. You're the authority. 
Even in the midst of the Sanhedrin, he said to Nicodemus, you are the teacher of Israel. He had the high exalted position at that time of being the one that all looked to as the top authority, top teacher of the law and God's word. Recognize how amazed Jesus' disciples must have been when they found out Jesus was meeting with this guy. This was Nicodemus. And Jesus had a meeting with him. Nicodemus came to Jesus. And that's incredible. He comes to talk with Jesus Christ. He was at the top He was religiously, morally, politically, socially, by all of the earth's standards, he was a success, but something was wrong. Well, everyone else was putting down Jesus. There were, of course, a select group of Pharisees. There were rulers who were saying he's working miracles There was something here I don't understand. And Nicodemus somehow realized he needed to redefine success. And just like we uh, need to sometimes realize that in our lives, if our lives are going to be spiritual success, and that's our goal as believers, have our lives to be a spiritual success, I trust that's your goal. Even if the whole world thinks we're a success, if our lives aren't a spiritual success, we've missed it, people. We know that, or we should know that as believers. If our lives are to be spiritual success, we have to take the time to define success clearly and carefully. If we don't define success, clearly we may end up settling for no goal at all and get to the end of our lives saying, maybe God wanted me to do something, some things, but I didn't take it, the time to really think about them. If we don't define success carefully, we might find ourselves striving for the wrong goals. You know, the old cliche that's out there, um, You get to the top of the ladder, and it's leaning against the wrong wall. Nicodemus is a member, is the number one example of this. He got to the top of the ladder, popularity, religion, riches, power, and he had all those things, but it was against the wrong wall. So he moved to the second thing that has to happen in our lives, people. So uh, our lives, if we're going to be a spiritual success, and it's simple, but it's incredibly important. You have to seek out Jesus Christ. The word says, so he sought out Jesus. He came to Jesus at the night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Now, you might want to circle if you're following along, but that we is important in that verse. We know. For no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing and God uh, was not with him. If God was not with him, sorry. People made a, a lot of this thing, and we, I know people who do this, make a lot of this thing that Nicodemus came to him at night. Why did he come at night? And you've probably heard, I, I've heard sermons preached on this. Well, he, uh, some people think that he came uh, because he didn't want people seeing him with Jesus. He was a high religious leader and Jesus was a controversial figure. That's a possibility. It could also have been something simple as the fact that he worked during the day. It could also have been the fact that he wanted some time alone with Jesus Christ. Some time where just he and Jesus could have a conversation. Whichever of those possibilities, there is something significant about the fact that he came at night. He was wise enough to come and talk to Jesus at a time when he wouldn't be pressured by the opinions of others. To speak out, uh, to seek out Jesus in a way where he could find him 
for himself. You know what it's like to seek out Jesus when you're reassured by the opinions of others? Well, this person thinks this, and your family thinks this, and your friends think this. See, Nicodemus was, was wise enough to come to Jesus at night where he could sit and ask the question he wanted to ask without worrying about what everybody else thought. Just about what Jesus thought. I need times like that in my life, and so do you. We need to seek out times like that. Even if uh, you've been a believer for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, 90, some of us in this church, we all regularly need times like this where we get away from the opinions and the judgment and the ideas of everybody else in the world. And we just say, Lord, what do you think? And take some time to listen to Jesus. Nicodemus did this. Of course, he sought out Jesus Christ. And Jesus had something to say to him. Verse 3. Rabbi, we, we know that, that you're a teacher. Come from God. And, and no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing unless God was with him. In reply, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What Jesus says there is amazing. It's amazing that the Bible says that Jesus said in reply, Jesus says this, here comes Nicodemus, let's get this in your picture in your mind, and says, you are a great man, Jesus, and we see all the signs. And Jesus answered him by saying, you've got to be born again. Now look at some significant things there. First of all, Jesus gets right to the point, doesn't he? Right to the, to the jugular vein. This is a habit of Jesus Christ. If you, if you want to learn something about communication from Jesus Christ, this is his one habit. He doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't walk up to Peter and say, I've got an investment opportunity for you, Peter. Can you come over to my house tonight? Maybe we can talk about it there. He doesn't do that, right? He says, Peter, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. When the rich young ruler comes to Jesus Christ and says, how do I follow all the commandments? Jesus doesn't say, uh, let's take uh, some time with this. He just says, leave everything you have and come follow me. Jesus has this habit of doing this, and he doesn't do it in a harsh way. He does it in a very clear way. I want to learn from Jesus Christ how to how to be in a clear way to get to the point and say, here's the truth. Because one of the keys to that is that he had compassion for everyone he spoke to. He wasn't trying to get through the conversation quickly, like I'm sometimes when I'm trying to talk to people. He wanted to speak clearly to people so he could change their lives. And he gets right to the point. And there's a second thing about what Jesus did. Jesus changes his pronouns here immediately, doesn't he? Did you notice this? Nicodemus comes and says, Jesus, a lot of us, we feel like you're, the te you're this teacher from God, and we really uh, respect you. And Jesus changes pronouns from we to you. I tell you the truth, he said. Unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. He looks at Nicodemus and starts to talk to him about his life. He didn't say, let's talk about how those other guys uh, feel about me. 
Jesus has this habit of making things personal in our lives. I know it's, for some of you, it may be where you don't like Scripture because it becomes personal. But he refuses to get involved in philosophical discussions. He makes everything a personal challenge. And the third thing I think what happens here is he says in reply is what's really happening. Jesus is answering Nicodemus' question before Nicodemus ever asks it. We just read at the end of chapter 2 that Jesus knew what was in a man. We talked about that last week. He knew what was on Nicodemus' heart. Well, there was a lot of talk about the kingdom of God in those days and achieving God's kingdom and being great in God's kingdom. His disciples, you remember, argued about this a lot. Even when they were going around with him, they talked about this a lot. Jesus answers this question. I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. That's the answer. Jesus said, be born again. If you want to be spiritually successful in life, if you want life at all to be a success, here's the key. He says, be born again. We've got to have that. We've got to be born again. So this question was an incredible challenge to Nicodemus. Because remember, he's, he's a Jew. His birth was the noblest of births. He was of the people of God. It's like walking up to to King uh, Charles and saying to him, well, you might have made something of yourself if you'd just been born in a little better family. Nicodemus could have easily thought, well, the Romans might need to be born again, but not me. I'm a Jew. But Jesus said to him, you've got to be born again. That was a great challenge to his life. That term born again, well, everybody in this room has, of course, heard it. It's used a lot in our society. We can talk, uh, and we use it a lot flippantly, like a lot of Christian terms. A football team has, uh, you know, was very bad last year, and they turned things around. Well, it was born again. A company that's been on the skids for years and their stock prices start to rise. We say, they're born again. You've got a soft drink out there that's not doing very well and then people start drinking it again. Well, it's born again as a soft drink. But that's not at all what the word means here. That's just there means some kind of renewal, some kind of coming back from something. Because it's used that way, we've got to take a moment. And when you read the Bible, sometimes you need to take a moment and figure out what the Bible actually means by that, what the word means. We've got to take a minute and look at what all the word means. So what does it mean? What does it mean to be born again? Well, the Greek word that's used here for born again means to be born again. And to be born from above. The one word means those two things. So this isn't just a fresh start. This isn't just renewal. It's something spiritual that happens in our lives, people. It points to an entirely new uh, spiritual birth. What Jesus is saying is you can't be uh, spiritually successful without a new birth. A spirituality can't be added to your life. You've got to start new. Of course, Nicodemus would have, would have wanted to add it on. He got the Pharisee stuff, the Sanhedrin stuff, the teacher of Israel stuff. Maybe I could just add this thing on to my life. Maybe this Jesus thing could, would be added on. Well, no, says Jesus. You've got to be born again. You've got to start fresh, start anew. Just about all of us, when we first start to confront Jesus Christ, and even when we first start to grow in Jesus as believers, we want to 
add him on. We want to make him a part of our lives instead of the whole of our lives. Do you get that? Jesus needs to be the whole of our lives. That's not how I'm spiritually successful. I've got to start new. I've got to be born again. And when Jesus says you must be born again, he's saying you've got to make your strategy of success spiritual. Some people have a strategy of success that's based on things that they can surround themselves with. Well, it won't work. It's not true success, people. Other people have a strategy of success that's based upon what other people are going to think about them. And that's a sure way for disaster. Nicodemus was wise enough to come to Jesus and say, well, what's the new strategy, Jesus? And Jesus says, here it is. It's simple. You've got to be born again. You, you, you don't scale new heights until you've experienced a new birth, is what he's saying. Nicodemus came and saying, how can I reach this next pinnacle? And Jesus says, you've got to start all over again. Got to start on the bottom rung. This is important for us to understand. It's very important for us to explain to those who don't know Jesus Christ what it means to be born again. To be spiritually successful, I have to understand and I have to help other people understand the difference between religion and regeneration. Because there's a huge difference between the two. Religion and regeneration. Nicodemus had the religion. When Jesus talked about being born again, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about regeneration. You know people today who think they can get close to God by keeping the Ten Commandments. They may not do as good a job as Nicodemus did. But millions of people still follow the same philosophy today. Religion says I can achieve God's favor by doing things. And the things I do. Regeneration says God's love is an undeserved gift in life. Religion says the good in my life can somehow outweigh the sin in my life. If I can get enough good, if... In, my, in there and somehow it's going to outweigh the sin in my life. What a joke. It's crazy when you realize the horror of sin. Of course, we live in a world that doesn't believe in sin anymore. When you realize how deeply it affects us, sin that is. But we don't see that. So we think we can get a little bit good in our life, and it will outweigh that sin. Well, people, that's religion. Regeneration says, Jesus' death on the cross forgave my sin. I don't need to balance it out. I need to blot it out by the blood of Jesus Christ. Religion says, I've got to give up a part of my life. I've got to give up the habit. I, I better not do that anymore. I, I give it up for Jesus. Well, that's religion. Regeneration says, I'm going to commit to him all of my life. Religion is trying harder. Regeneration is trusting him. That's what it means to be born again. When you and I are born again, that means when you, uh, you're born, you have no past, you're forgiven. But you've got a future that's bright and full of hope, people. As believers, it's this birth that's the most important birth in our lives. When people ask you how old you are, you can legitimately answer how old you are spiritually because that's the most important birth in your life. And you've got to do this. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, he had a hard time understanding this. He said, how? How can a man be born 
when he is old. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. You'll find out that two times Nicodemus asks, how can this happen? And two times Jesus gives several verses of an answer. We don't have time today to discover that. We will do that for Sunday back in June, I guess, um, after our missions month. But the thing that you've got to know is that you need to be born again. You need to surrender all of your life. Not tack Jesus on. That's not how to be a Christian. We don't tack it on. We give our life to him. We surrender to him. We are born again in the spirit of God. Let's bow our heads and as we come to the table of the Lord and remember the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for each and every one of us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Great God in heaven, Father, I know that I've just skimmed the surface even though we've talked a while here. But every one of us needs to look at our lives and ask ourselves, have we been truly born again? Are we truly born of the Spirit? Or have we just been trying to tack on and been religious? We haven't allowed you to come in and regenerate us. We haven't put our trust and our faith in you and in what your word has to say. Father, I pray that each person this morning here as we will come to the table and give thanks for what Jesus did on the cross, but that each one of us understands. That each one of us wants to seek to be born again, to have that new life in Jesus Christ. Father God, speak to us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I know we're doing this out of order. If you come to class 101, I'll tell you that we don't have to have it on the first Sunday of every month, okay? And we're doing this because uh, with the guests that we are going to have over uh, May, I thought it was easier for us to be able to, as a church, as the body of Christ, to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. And so I'm going to ask that you would come now, and uh, you don't all have to come, but whoever comes on your behalf, uh, come and get a a cup and the bread, and we will uh, worship the Lord as we remember what Jesus has done for us. from the Apostle Paul. Paul writes this, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Paul writes this. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, as we humble ourselves before your table, before this communion table, before this Passover, uh, before this love feast, Father. Father, we ask that you might search our hearts. And Father, that you might make us aware of anything that we need to confess right now that would make us unworthy of partaking of these elements, Father. Maybe we're holding on to some unforgiveness and right now we need to forgive somebody. Or maybe we even need to forgive ourselves, Father. Maybe there's some hate in our lives. Father God, speak to our heart that we might confess it, that we might be worthy. Hear our prayers of confession right now, Lord. Father God, your word tells us that as we're praying these prayers of confession this morning, Lord, your word tells us that you will place them as far as the east is from the west, never to revisit them again. Father God, I pray that you would help us never to revisit them again. Cleanse our heart, O Lord. Father God, we thank you for this table. We thank you for what Jesus Christ did on that cross for us. We thank you as he laid down his life for us that we might have life, that we might be able to be reborn by the blood of Christ. Father God, as we come to this table, may you bless it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I remind you again, uh, be careful as you open uh, the package. There are two levels, and uh, the first one is not the easiest one to get to, but get to it first. Don't open the whole package, or you'll be spilling grape juice all over yourself. We read in scripture that in that upper room, Christ said that the bread symbolized his body, which was broken for you and for me. I'm going to ask Peter to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving for the, cup, or for the bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the symbol <clears throat> of the bread. Jesus was the bread of life. He described his death as a sacrifice. He described his death and sacrifice as a kernel of wheat that would produce much fruit. We are the fruit of that and saved by your son through his sacrifice. Nourish us with your love and grace as we take this bread in gratitude. Amen. the symbol of Christ's body that was broken for you and for me. Let us take a moment as we eat it to remember the sacrifice that that Jesus made for each and every one of us. Let's eat all of it.
We also read in scripture that night that Christ took the cup. And he said that this cup symbolized the new covenant, a new covenant made in his blood. I'm going to ask Jeff to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving for the cup. Let us pray. Lord, we can only thank you for what this cup of juice represents. There's nothing that we can do other than follow your ways to repay you. You took the torture that we deserved and gave us salvation that we didn't deserve. For this, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we open this cup, let us rejoice in the representation of the new covenant, in the new life that it represents in Jesus Christ, and the washing away of our sins, never to be revisited again. Let's drink all of it and rejoice. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this table, O Lord. And we thank you for reminding us of the sacrifice that you made for us. Father, may all of those who believe here today, may we live that out in our everyday lives, that others might come to know the saving grace and the love of God, the amazing love of God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We read in scripture that after they had eaten and sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Let us uh, sing together, I have decided to follow Jesus. Let's stand together. Father God, as we go our separate ways, probably most of us are going to go have a coffee uh, after service, O Lord, here. But Father God, may your spirit go with each and every one of us. May your spirit be our guide and director from this moment on and forevermore. And Father, may we live the kind of life that attracts others to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.